I grew up in, well, I spent the first formative years of my life in, in Bathurst, New Brunswick. And there, uh, the, the music teacher in the school I went to was, I didn't like her. I didn't like her. I don't know why. She wore fancy high heels and crazy clothes. And I should have liked her, but I didn't. And she went around listening to everyone sing. And then she told you whether you were a bluebird or a redbird. And she told me I was a red bird. And do you know what that meant? It meant that when you had to sing in the festival, you just moved your mouth and you didn't make a sound. You just mouthed the words. I didn't know it was a mean thing until later in my life when I realized it had ruined my life forever. Anyway, fast forward. I wanted to learn to play the piano, but we didn't have money for lessons or for a piano. But my best friend down the street was forced to take piano lessons, which she did not like. She was a bookworm. She didn't want to be practicing the piano. So we had this arrangement. She showed me on her piano. She showed me the music. She said, that's middle C. And she pointed to the C. And then I, I played the C and I counted up one, two, three, four. I played the F. I didn't know it was called F. I just counted. And eventually I sounded like I was practicing her piano lesson. I don't know if her mother was fooled or not, but she got to read all the time. Later on, I moved to the United States when my father got a job just outside New York, and I sang in the school choir, and I even got into the special choir where you had to audition, Red Bird and all. We finally had money for a piano and lessons. I worked at it, but it was a little too late. Anyway, time passed. I went to university. I went to the university, State University of New York at Potsdam. They had a music school and I just wanted to be near the music school. Finally, after a crisis of existence, I auditioned for the music school, playing a very simple piece of music and not very well. And I had to sing for them too. And they said, my dear, we, we can't let you in based on your piano playing, but we might be able to do something with your voice. And the red bird said, I don't think so. I, I never thought of that at all. I didn't think of the possibilities. And I carried on with English literature, became a librarian, got a job in Newfoundland, and finally went back to taking piano lessons as an adult. I had a teacher who was going to fix all the mistakes I had made for myself when I taught myself how to play. And there were a lot. It took her two years of whapping me on the knuckles practically. And I was in my, in my 30s uh, trying to fix all the bad habits I had. And upstairs, my landlady had to listen to this. And she said there was one, I'd play the minute waltz in five minutes. And she said there was one day when she was about to come downstairs and tell me, stop playing the minute waltz. And mercifully, I stopped. After three years of taking lessons as an adult and working full time as a library administrator, I had learned three songs. The Minute Waltz, taking five minutes, part of a Beethoven sonata, the slow bit, of course, and a lovely piece by Mozart, which has a zipping cadenza in it that I played at about eight the right time. And Ron, by then Ron was in my life, he said, you know, You've been taking lessons all these years. It would have been cheaper to buy the three CDs. Anyway, <laughs> we retired. We moved to Nova Scotia. I decided to join. The first thing I wanted to do was join another choir. And I poked along as an alto or a second soprano for years. And one day a woman came to rehearsal and said, I'm offering this workshop called Sing Yourself Well. And I thought, wow, if anybody needs to be made well through singing, it's me. I signed up. She said, why don't you come and take a lesson before the workshop? Which I did. And she said, my dear, you're not an alto. You are a soprano. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I'd always wanted to be a soprano. The, the, the second sopranos have the most boring parts and hardly any at all. So I kept taking lessons, I kept taking lessons, and I started to learn to sing. And we had an anniversary celebration for the choir, and I sang a solo, I can't believe it. 
And there was a man came to the party and he said, I am getting together a pickup choir to sing at Carnegie Hall. And anybody who's interested can come and audition. And I went over and I said, it wasn't on my bucket list, but that, that sounds like a lot of fun. So he'd heard me say, sing and he talked to my choir director, says, you don't need to audition. I went to the rehearsals in Halifax. There were people from across Canada all going to Carnegie Hall. This is what keeps Carnegie Hall going. We pay to go, this is vanity, we pay to sing, but we worked very hard and we sang a Nova Scotia piece called The Celtic Mass for the Sea by Scott McMillan. And Ron went with me, we went to New York. I invited my high school friends from New York. And by then I was waiting for a knee replacement and had a bad ankle. The rehearsals were intense. And then we had 45 minutes to practice with the house band at Carnegie Hall, which is a pretty amazing little orchestra. They have to learn all this new music every day for all of these uh, choirs that come in to sing at Carnegie Hall so they can say they sang at Carnegie Hall. I was so sore, I went and put my feet up and didn't think I could do it. My feet were totally asleep. The people backstage at Carnegie Hall were lovely. They treated us all like we were the divas of the universe. I went and for half an hour, I stood on the stage at Carnegie Hall and golly gee, I got the B flat. 